Lord, we celebrate that Christmas is here. And we confess, God, that when we say Christmas is here, we're not talking about December 25th. We're talking about the wonderful beauty that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Lord, in light of your incarnation, of your death and your resurrection, we join the church in praying, come, Lord Jesus, come and return. Have your way in this space, God. We pray that you would speak. We pray that you, this would be a day, this would be a season of hope for the weary, of hope for the joyful, and everything in between. We love you, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. So this morning, as we look at this hope in darkness and we reflect on this already not yet reality as a church, we meet Zechariah. We learn here in verses five and following, it says that in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we have Elizabeth and Zechariah, and we learn that Zechariah is a priest. Later on in the story, we learn that he gets this special privilege as a priest to be coming and selected for this special offering. We also know that he's married to Elizabeth and the author Luke wants us to know that Elizabeth is also a pretty special lady. She is from the, a descendant of Aaron, the great priest, the brother of Moses. The, the lineage of the people who have been serving in the temple have been the, the advocates and the mediators for the people of God for thousands of years. And from this special family we see um, this message. But it's really interesting. As you learn about Zechariah and Elizabeth, we learn that they were both righteous before God. This reference to being righteous before God is most likely a reference to their, their, their commitment and faithfulness to the law of God, to the ways of God. It says that they were walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They were faithful to the, to the ways of God that, that is laid out in the Old Testament. But the author of Luke does something here. We would expect that a people who have been faithful, who have been following the ways of God, would be blessed. But we learn here, it says, but they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Barrenness in that time was an incredibly heavy, it, it always is for families. A difficult season to go through, especially in the Old Testament times when your identity and your, and your lineage and your future was oftentimes tied to having children. And so even though these people who were walking blamelessly, living righteously, doing all the things that you should do for the blessings of God, it seems to be that they have this curse. But Luke here is letting us know something. Because he's letting us know that if you know the Old Testament story, whenever we read that, that God had not given them a child yet, if you know in the stories of Abraham, and even his own son, and Isaac. That the stories of a barren woman oftentimes lead to the incredible providence and grace of God showing up and giving a child. And so as you read this, the Hebrew reader would build a little bit of anticipation that something special is coming. They would see this. Perhaps it's a very dark time, a difficult time, but they start to maybe get a little glimmer. Almost like if you've been in the morning and you just start to see the sun just starting to peak up. You start to feel this. And it seems to me that as you look at this, we see three aspects of hope that start to grow. I love in the, in the poem, it says hope was not something, it was growing. 
And the first thing we see here is that Zechariah gets what I would like to call a sacred privilege. Zechariah gets this sacred privilege. It says that he's old, he's blameless, he's been waiting for a child to come. And then look at verse 8. It says this. It says, now while he was serving as priest before God, it was the, the, the season that he was to be working in the temple, when his division was on duty, it was their time, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by Lot, Lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now this is a really special, uh, commentators say this was probably a once in a lifetime opportunity. A once in a lifetime opportunity for Zechariah to be in what, what, what we know to be the holy place. A special place in the temple that was reserved only for the priest and in particular times and places they would come in the morning and in the evening for a special offering and, and it would be coordinated with the prayers of the people and they would offer their incense to God and he got selected. This is almost like Willy Wonka on the chocolate factory, Charlie getting the golden ticket. He has this sacred privilege, this special privilege. He's invited into something where he gets to be in the very presence of God, the picture of the presence of God to bring before God the prayers of the people. And it says, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So, so the people are praying, and, and most likely, if you know this story, it's been 400 years since they've heard from God. It's been 400 years since the prophet Malachi. And generation after generation after generation has been sitting in darkness praying that all the prophecies from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah, all of these words about one who would come to Bethlehem, ones about the suffering servant who would be Emmanuel, where, where light would shine in darkness, all of these prayers have been happening for 400 years and, Isaiah, and, and Zechariah is coming into this holy place. And he's probably living in a season of true darkness. And he's bringing before the Lord this prayer. And he has this sacred privilege. It's a special privilege. And he's going into this space all by himself. The people are there anticipating this moment. And then something unbelievable happens. Not only in this sacred privilege does he get to do these special privileges of the priest, an angel shows up and makes this unbelievable promise. Key word, unbelievable. It truly is unbelievable. Look at what happens. It says, and there appeared before him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. The, the right side is probably a reference to the favor of God. Oftentimes it would be on the, the right side of the throne. So the favor of God seems to be here and it says, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. Now, this is a reality. When angels of God show up, they're, they're, they're not the typical, like, like when we watch like more uh, pop culture ideas of like a cute little angel that shows up and, and, you know, and, and it's like someone that's like gonna be your best friend and they're gonna they help you know. When angels in the Bible show up, you fall on your face and you're terrified and you wonder if you're going to live. This is, this is really, when any sorts of, of awareness to supernatural powers, whether it's evil or good, there truly is this reality within us of true fear and trembling. And it's visceral. And Zechariah is in this hope, hopeful darkness and an angel shows up and he's terrified. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Now, there's a lot of debate amongst commentators. What is the prayer that is being talked about? Is this the prayer that he just prayed probably for the Messiah to come, probably with 400 years that have been praying for generation after generation that the, the promised Messiah who would bring salvation would come? Is this his prayer for a child? I imagine it's yes to both. I mean, think about it. 
This is a little conjecture, so this is just Logan giving some commentary. I feel like if I was like Charlie in the chocolate factory and I got to go into the sacred space and I got to bring my prayers to God and I've been wanting a child for 70 plus years, I'd probably be like, you know what, it's worth a shot. Hey God, I'm here, here's, here's my prayers. Also, could you, give us, could you give us a child? Also, Lord, because you, I don't understand. I've been living blamelessly. I've been doing all the things. I've been, I've, been, I've been trying my hardest to live in the ways that you called me to live, yet for some reason, you're silent. Whatever it is, it seems to be that Zechariah is bringing the prayers of the people to God, and we learn here from the angel that the prayer's been heard. Not just heard, it's going to be answered. It says, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John and his presence will do what? It will give you joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Now, not just because, like Elizabeth's having a baby. (laughs) Look at this. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. This is a reference that he's going to be special. This was a reference to a consecration that would happen. That he would be set apart, very similar to, to the prophet Samuel, that was born to a barren woman named Hannah. He'll be set apart, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. If you keep reading, you learn later on that Mary has a similar interaction with Gabriel, is learned that she's gonna be bearing the son, and then she comes and talks to Elizabeth, and it says that when, when she comes and talks to Elizabeth, it says that the spirit descended upon Elizabeth and that the baby leapt in his mother's womb. So early on, we know that this prophet will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and look at this. This is what makes the people so excited. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. This word turn is the same word for repentance. It's a hyperlink or it's telling us that there's gonna be a reform that's gonna be happening in the people and he will go before him, him being the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the children, of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. This is is a, a, a direct reference to a prophecy from 400 years ago to the prophet Malachi when he said in Malachi chapter four, he said, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, word for word, and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. If you remember, we actually looked at the story of Elijah last year around this time, and Elijah was one who came and brought about true reform for the people of God. They were under an evil king named Ahaz. And the whole story of Elijah is this prophet coming and bringing hope and bringing rain and bringing miracles to a people who are living in darkness and and bringing about this reform. And God is telling Zechariah in this moment of darkness, hope is growing. And picture Zechariah here. Yeah, how can you not just like laugh in this moment? And look at his response. Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. I remember we were looking at this, the teaching team, Pastor Doug said, I mean, can you really blame the dude? His wife is old, she's barren, and notice here, he doesn't say, yeah, right. He doesn't even laugh, like Sarah did with, with, the, with, 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 with uh, the, the angel. He just says, Lord, I need a sign. What would you give me a sign? He has this sacred privilege and this unbelievable promise and he says, God, I just need something to hold on to. I'm gonna go out there, and there's gonna be all these people, and I'm gonna tell them that I just saw an angel, and they're gonna wonder what was in, like, I, what I had for lunch. 
And I'm gonna tell them that the angel told me that, that, that my wife is gonna have a baby and then they're gonna start really being concerned for me or they're gonna start challenging me. And so what happens here is the angel hears this, sees this, and I believe plants a new perspective in Zechariah. A new perspective in Zechariah as he thinks about this promise. Remember, he's living in darkness. He's living in hopelessness. I mean, he did just have this encounter with an angel, but he's still wrestling. And look at what happens here. It says, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this for I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years? And the angel answered him, I'm Gabriel. (laughs) I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. If you know Gabriel, this is an, an archangel. This is, a, 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 this is a, a, a truly powerful being. He shows up in, in the story of Daniel. He shows up in different places. And he's a messenger of God. And he says, I stand in the presence of God. This should be enough. He says, but behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. He says, you want a sign? You're asking for a sign, I'll give you a sign. Your sign is you're literally not gonna be able to talk. And look at what happens here, I find this really funny. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. They're saying, hey, usually it doesn't take this long to, to light the incense, what happened? And when he came out, he was unable to speak to him, to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and he remained mute. Eddie and our teaching team said, this is probably one of the funniest games of charades you've ever seen. Did you imagine Zechariah, they're trying to act out. There was like this angel and like, and like he was big and strong and like my wife's gonna have, I'm not gonna act that out for you, he's gonna have a baby and, 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 and it's gonna be the Messiah, but he's muted. And I think this is really fascinating for us as we think about Advent season. His wife is pregnant. There's this longing for, 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 for the coming of this child that he's been waiting for. And it's here, he sees her growing. He knows that this life is growing, but yet, instead of being able to talk about it, instead of being able to to share about it, he's actually redirected with this new perspective where he just can't talk. And he has to listen. And he has to observe. And he has this time, I, I, I really think a discipline of silence. Have you ever tried being quiet for a while? Anybody like me, like you're in the car and you need to have the car radio on? One of my favorite songs, somebody, you know, there's a, car, a song called Car Radio and I just sit in silence and it's driving me crazy. You ever tried just to be quiet and not talk and listen and observe? I would encourage you when you do this, you're gonna find that your awareness raises to all that is happening around you and the people around you and the opportunities around you, and probably the very presence of God around you. And in this moment, when Zechariah can't contain himself, his wife is to have a child, and this child has all these words, but he can't tell the people yet. He's in this moment of already and not yet. It's fascinating to think about. And yet he lives with what we would call this theme that Christmas is here. That Christmas is here. And as we ask this question, how does this apply to me? What, what about this story of, of, this, of, of this experience for Zechariah? How does this apply to me? I, I don't got any Gabriels showing up in my living room. I don't got any promises, as a matter of fact, I'm still living with this longing for the Lord to do something and nothing happening, or I'm, I'm living in this, in this darkness, or I'm, I'm looking at the news, or I'm thinking about our world, and I'm longing for things, and I'm just wondering, like, how is this applied to me? 
And what I love is that this story is not over for us. As we read this, we see we get to fast forward to nine months. And I truly believe that, that, the, that, the, that the words that come out of Zechariah's mouth, the first thing he says are not just for the people at that moment, they're actually for us today. And they're about the darkness that we may feel today. And I believe that there really is one exhortation and one question that we should consider out of the first words, the utterances of Zechariah when his baby's born. Look at verses 68 and following. Little context, it won't have it on the screen, but it says, the baby's born and his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So what we're about to read is the very Spirit of God coming upon him and prophesying about the future for this child. Look at what he says. Blessed be the God, the Lord God of Israel, for he has, if you have your Bible, and I would encourage you to circle this, he has visited and redeemed his people. And has reigned up, a, raised up, circle that word, raised, a horn of salvation for us. The horn is a reference to a crown. In the house of his servant David, this is telling us that, that, he's, that the Messiah is coming. And as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Malachi, and that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And then, look at this, he grabs his child and he speaks a blessing over John in this moment. Look what happens here, he says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord, reference to Jesus, to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. And how is this salvation coming? Is it to overcome Rome? Is it to become a great empire? Actually, no, the salvation comes by this, the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby, I love this moment, the sunrise shall visit us from on high. The sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. We're gonna learn more about the peace next week. Hope in darkness. He's saying the, the fulfillment of Isaiah 9-2 when Isaiah says that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. As you think about Christmas, and you think about the darkness that we feel, or, or, or just the weariness sometimes of this season, my challenge to you is this. Don't miss the sunrise of Christ in Christmas. Don't miss the sunrise of Christ this Christmas. It's truly the same hope. If, I would encourage you, if you have time, go and read the resurrection account of Jesus. It's fascinating. Jesus has just been killed on the cross. He's been crucified. He's dead three days. And it says that early morning on Easter, the, as the sun rises, this is a reference in, in, in Malachi, when, when we learn in Malachi as he prophesies that, that the sun of righteousness will rise, that we have hope in darkness, and it's here. And hear this. I worked really hard on your three points today because I really wanted to spell out S-U-N. I hope you appreciate that. Because I want you to remember this. And sometimes we read these old stories and we think, oh, that was so cute. I love the story, Zachariah, he's mute, he plays charades, that's awesome, great. But it's the same for us. That sacred privilege that Zachariah had of being in the holy 
of being in the space before God where he gets to go before God and he gets to pour out his heart. He gets to pour out his darkness. Look at what it says in Hebrews 4.14. It says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, who's felt the darkness that we live in, yet without sin. Look at this, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Beloved, you are invited into that sacred privilege. And beloved, as you are invited into that sacred privilege, hear this, you are given an unbelievable promise. Christmas is here. Sometimes in Christmas, in Advent season, we miss it and we don't realize that, that, that the focus is, is not on just waiting for Jesus to come. He's already come. Now we're longing for him to return. And the unbelievable promise that he is with us and he will return. And so you have this sacred privilege and you have this unbelievable promise. And finally, you also have this new perspective because of, of who Christ is, because of the gifts that we are given. And I would encourage you, if you have time, we're out of time here, but in Ephesians chapter one, uh, Paul tells us about, about we, are, we are received the full blessings of Christ. Now, let's read it, it's just too good. Ephesians 1, 7, it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mysteries of his will according to his purposes which he set forth in Christ as a plan to the fullness of time to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose of him who works all things through us to the counsel of his will. Now hear this, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ may be to the praise of his glory. Don't miss the sunrise of Christ this Christmas, beloved. And second, in light of that exhortation, my challenge to you this Advent season is how will you walk in Christ this Christmas? Advent is different than Christmas time in our culture. It's not about like, like I don't know about you, but I oftentimes have the FOMO, like I'm gonna miss out on all the opportunities to have these experiences for Christmas. Advent is the opposite. It's actually a time to slow down. It's a time to, as a family, say, I'm not gonna let all these festivities and all the trappings of Christmas cause me to miss the sunrise of Christ. And I challenge you, what are you going to do this Christmas season to not miss the sunrise of Christ every morning? I love in Lamentations, it says, morning by morning, new mercies I see. As in Colossians, so as you walk, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you, look at this, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. As you head off to lunch, you head off to your, whatever you're doing for the rest of the day, hopefully watching the 49ers beat down the Eagles. Merry Christmas. But I would encourage you, don't get distracted by that football game. I know for my family, we try to do a daily devotional. Maybe you get that advent calendar. Maybe, maybe for some of us, we could learn from Zechariah and we could actually try to develop rhythms of silence in our day. Or instead of telling the Lord what we want, instead of trying to get, just, just get all of the tasks done, we actually do nothing and we just say, Lord, I'm here. 
and we just listen to the Spirit of God. Don't miss the sunrise of Christ this Christmas. One of the, one of the um, devotions that we're doing, the Advent calendar with the Bible Project, I love the end of it, that they talk about hope. Tim Mackey says this, he says Christmas, Christian hope is bold. Waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death, and some would say it's crazy. And maybe it is, but biblical hope is an optimist based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God. To bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. And that's what the biblical words for hope are all about. As it says in Romans, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Listen, church, I'm not telling you to fake it. I'm not telling you to deny the darkness. I'm not telling you to pretend like this is not a weary world, but we are a weary world that rejoices and that waits with expectation. And so as you think about this, Let's go to the Lord before the Lord and let's come to the table and commune together in this hope. Let's pray. Spirit of God, thank you for the story of Zechariah. Thank you for the, the, the incredible, sacred privilege that we have, the unbelievable promise and the new perspective that we have in you. Lord, I pray that you would help us this Christmas season that we would not miss the sunrise. I pray, God, that even right now, as we get to come before you and get to share in communion, God, that we would truly partake together in this beautiful gift from you. We love you, Lord, in your name we pray, amen.